Chapter 10 is essentially a crash course on earth science. Before we get into the earth's resources, we have to know where they actually come from. We will start with the earth's interior. The earth's interior is comprised of three concentric zones, the core, mantle, and crust. Each of these layers are further broken down into different sections. The core is mostly made of iron and has a solid inner core and a liquid outer core. The core is a source of the Earth's magnetic field. Next, we have the mantle. It is the thickest layer and is made up of mostly silicon, iron, oxygen, and magnesium. This layer is a plastic liquid, meaning that it flows. The flowing of heat through the mantle create what we know as convection currents. The upper portion of the mantle is the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is closer to a solid form than the rest of the mantle, but is still considered a liquid. Last, we have the crust. This is the outer layer of Earth on which we live. It is the thinnest layer and is broken up into two major types. 29% is continental, aka found underneath the land, and 71% is oceanic, aka found underneath the oceans. There are differences in the density of the two major types of crust. Continental crust is mostly granite, which is light, and oceanic crust is mostly basalt, which is much denser. The overall composition of the crust from the greatest percentage to the lowest is oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, and potassium. As a result, most rocks found on the planet are made up of these. Besides the asthenosphere, which I have already mentioned, we have one more special layer, the lithosphere. The lithosphere contains the crust and uppermost mantle. Where the asthenosphere ends, the lithosphere begins. All of the rocks and soils we see and study are part of this layer. The Earth's crust is broken up into sections called plates. The theory of plate tectonics states that these plates move over the molten mantle and separate or collide at boundaries. Our evidence for this idea comes from seafloor spreading experienced at divergent oceanic boundaries and the theory of continental drift. Again, the driving force comes from convection currents in the mantle. The interior of the Earth is extremely warm. This warmth from the core heats up the lower mantle. The, lower, the warmer magma flows upwards and towards the surface. It pushes along the tectonic plates like a conveyor belt and causes the plates to move with it. Crust is constantly being recycled as a result. Where magma is rising in the mantle, new material moves to Earth's surface and new crust is created. As the new crust forms, the older crust is pushed aside and the plates move apart from one another. Conversely, where magma is sinking, lithospheric plates are pulled together as the older crust is pulled downwards. This is how the crust itself gets recycled. The cycling of hardened and cooled magma to form the crust helps create mountains, volcanoes, the oceanic ridge system, and trenches. It is actually helps explain how biological evolution occurred. We have three major types of plate boundaries. The first of these are divergent boundaries. Divergent plate boundaries occur where convection currents are, pushed, are pushing magma upwards. Again, this pushes the older crust aside and causes the plates to move apart from one another. Divergent boundaries are the sources of mid-ocean ridges under the water and rift valleys on land. They are considered areas of new crust formation. The next type of plate boundary we have is a convergent boundary. This occurs in areas where convection currents pull magma downwards. As a result, crust is destroyed and the plates move towards one another. The type of crust involved determines the effects of the boundary. If you have a continental oceanic convergent boundary, for example, the denser oceanic crust will subduct or sink beneath the continental crust. This forms an oceanic trench in the actual meeting of the plates and a volcanic arc on the continental shelf. If both plates are oceanic, then the older oceanic plate subducts up beneath the newer plate because it is denser, mainly because it is much cooler. This forms the same geological features, but both are found in the ocean. This prime example of this is Japan. Japan is an island arc right next to an oceanic trench due to it being found on an oceanic oceanic convergent boundary. The last type of convergent boundary we have is between two continental plates. Here, neither plate is denser, so we see the formation of folded mountains like the Himalayas. Both crusts push together and then upwards, but they don't shoot up forever. Gravity still exists, surprise surprise, and it causes the mountains to crumble when they become too tall. The last type of boundary we have are transform boundaries. Here we don't see convergence or divergence, but the plates slide past one another. This creates a lot of shearing stress, so earthquakes are very prevalent in these locations. The best example we have of a transform fault is the San Andreas Fault that splits through California. There are external and internal processes that help shape the Earth's surface. We've just learned about the internal processes and we'll now focus on the external. 
Internal processes are driven by the heat of the Earth's interior, while external processes are driven by gravity and the sun's energy. These external processes include weathering and erosion. Weathering is the process of breaking down material through chemical or mechanical means. Mechanical processes just physically break down the material. There is no change in the chemical composition. It is literally just smaller. Examples include frost wedging and glaciers. Chemical processes alter the actual chemical composition of the material. Examples include mainly water, seeing as it is the universal solvent, but also acids as well. Once the material has been weathered, it is then moved in the process of erosion. This involves the actual picking up of material and then deposition of it downstream or downwind. Water and wind are the two biggest erosional agents on Earth. As a result, internal processes build up and external processes break down the Earth's surface. This material I've been mentioning is either in the form of a mineral or a rock. They are not the same thing. Minerals have a set chemical composition. If you take a sample of a mineral, it will always have the same ratios of atoms. As a result, they can generally be found with a crystalline structure. Examples include diamonds and sulfur. Rocks are compilations of multiple minerals, at least two different types, but these minerals are not found in a set ratio. Different samples of the same rock will show different ratios of each mineral observed. Examples include limestone and chalk. There are three major types of rocks that are all named based off of their formation. Igneous rocks are formed by cooling lava or magma, as an, an example is granite. Sedimentary rocks form over long periods of time when sediment and organic material are compacted and eventually cemented together. This is why you can find fossils in sedimentary rocks only. Examples include shale and sandstone. Metamorphic rock is a little different. Here, rocks that already exist undergo intense heat and pressure underneath the Earth's surface and are deformed to create new rocks. Examples include slate and marble. Moving back towards the plate tectonic side, I want to discuss a few natural hazards that can result from moving plates. The first natural hazard is an earthquake. As the plates slide around over the mantle, there is a lot of stress that builds up along their boundaries. Sometimes the stress is released slowly over time and it is fairly undetectable, but sometimes the stress is released very suddenly. The result is a massive release of energy in the form of waves that resonates through the Earth's surface and its interior. This release of energy is known as an earthquake. These quakes occur along fractures in the Earth's surface called faults. The actual origin of the earthquake or release of energy is known as the focus. For mapping and location purposes, we refer to the epicenter of the earthquake. This is found by literally finding the place on the Earth's surface over top of the focus. Earthquakes release energy in three different forms. P waves, also known as primary waves, move the Earth's surface like a slinky. They compress and decompress the Earth as the energy moves. S waves, or secondary waves, move slower than P waves and follow more of an S shape. These cause more damage to the Earth's surface than P waves. Last, we have surface waves. These are the slowest moving, but also the scariest, because they cause the most damage. We can determine how strong an earthquake is by measuring its magnitude based off of the Richter scale. The Richter scale ranges from 1 to 10, with 1 being fairly weak and 10 being the strongest. Each step increased or decreased in the Richter scale is a change of 10 times instead of just 1. Famous earthquakes to know include the January 2010 7.0 magnitude earthquake that struck Haiti. It killed over 200,000 people and injured 300,000 more. In 2011, there was a 9.0 magnitude earthquake that hit Japan. This triggered a 33-foot tsunami or massive wave generated by earthquakes. That's much larger than you think it is. Measure it out if you want to. This earthquake and resulting tsunami created a nuclear power plant failure at Fukushima and resulted in a nuclear disaster on par with the Chernobyl explosion in 1986. Next, we have volcanoes. These are literally just defined as areas where magma reaches the surface. Here it becomes lava, by the way. When a volcano erupts, obviously it releases lava, but it can also release ejecta, or solid debris, and gases. These gases include water vapor, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. Notice that all of these are either greenhouse gases or are considered pollutants. Volcanoes are natural sources of air pollution as a result. There are three major categories of volcanoes that are all based off of where they are formed. Rift volcanoes occur at divergent boundaries. Notice that we also have rift valleys at divergent boundaries. Subduction volcanoes occur at convergent boundaries. 
Notice this is the only place you see subduction of plates. And hotspot volcanoes are a little funky. They don't form along plate boundaries, but actually in the middle of them. The name itself isn't for shock factor. They literally form in areas where there's a superheated area in the mantle that forces magma to the surface. It's literally a hot spot. Examples include Yellowstone National Park's volcanoes in the Hawaiian Islands. Famous volcanoes to be aware of include Mount St. Helens. Its last explosion was in 1980 and led to the destruction of the entire dome of the volcano itself. Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines last erupted in 1999 and released 18 million metric tons of sulfur dioxide. As a result, it cooled the earth for about two years in what is known as a volcanic winter. Last, we have the Yellowstone caldera. This is what is known as a supervolcano in Wyoming that could erupt at any moment and cause global complications, as light as a volcanic winter, but also as drastic as a massive extinction. The explosion itself is expected to release an ash cloud that will engulf the entire United States. Another part of the lithosphere we have to discuss is soil. This is not just dirt or broken down rock. Soil also contains biological material, both decaying and still alive in the form of bacteria, water, gases, and mineral nutrients. Soil is considered renewable because it is naturally replenished, but it is replenished very slowly. So at the rate we are currently using it, we will now almost consider it a non-renewable resource. It takes a long time for rock to be weathered, eroded, and deposited, and for organic material to be decomposed. Soils that are well established have what is known as a soil profile. If you were to take a core sample of the soil, then it would have the expected layers or soil horizons. We can characterize soils based off of their texture. Soil texture is determined by the amount of sand, silt, and clay it contains. We can use what is known as a soil triangle to help us characterize it. The soil texture determines the porosity and permeability of the soil. Porosity refers to the amount of pore space found in between soil particles. Permeability refers to the rate at which water is able to flow through soil. Since sand, silt, and clay all have differing particle sizes, having varying percentages of each of these particles can heavily influence the soil's ability to retain water. Sand particles are massive, so water flows easily through it because it's hard to compact these particles together. Clay is the opposite. The particles are much slow, are smaller, so water doesn't flow through very easily. It's the reason we see clay layers underneath aquifers. There are a few factors that influence soil development. The first factor is parent material. This is the rock that underlies the soil itself and is the source of the rock material found in said soil. Next, we have climate. The average temperature and precipitation levels in an area helps determine the type and amount of weathering and erosion we see in said climate. This determines first, how quickly the soil forms, and secondly, what material helps make up the soil. Living things in the soil also affect how the soil is formed. Bacteria are the main organisms that help cycle nutrients through the biogeochemical cycles and also play a huge role in the weathering and erosion of the parent material. Last, we have topography. Topography refers to the shape of the land or changes in elevation. Higher elevations are impacted by weathering and erosion caused by the force of gravity at a higher rate because the materials are being pulled down even harder. Elevation also impacts leaching. Leaching is the pulling of dissolved and suspended materials downward through soil due to gravity. This impacts the nutrient levels at the surface where most organisms come into contact with the soil. Back to gravity. Gravity is the main cause of soil erosion. It not only pulls the soil itself downwards, but water downwards as well, and thus even more soil with it. This movement of water displaces all of this soil. There are four major types of water erosion. The first is splash erosion. This is simply soil displacement due to raindrops. In larger storms, you have what is called sheet erosion. This isn't just at the water droplet level, but an entire sheet of soil is wiped away because of rain. You've probably seen real erosion, R-I-L-L, -L, not R-E-A-L, on a construction site at some point. Real erosion is when soil is eroded away in small strips, almost like little itty bitty streams. Last, we have gully erosion. This is real erosion taken to the extreme. Over time, water can strip away at a reel and eventually create an entire gully or a wide ravine. How does this impact us? Mainly in agriculture. With the soil goes nutrients, dissolved gases, and water necessary for plant growth. 
It can lead to pollution as well as it carries these things to nearby waterways where they shouldn't be. It can take hundreds of years to naturally replace an inch of soil that can easily be stripped away with a single flooding event. Globally, the Earth is losing 7-21% to 21 of its topsoil each decade due to erosion. In the United States, about a third of the nation's topsoil has been swept away due to improper land management. In agricultural areas, the soil is being stripped away 16 times faster. Obviously, this is a growing problem. A major concern with the loss of topsoil is desertification. This is literally what it sounds like, the drying up of land. Currently, we are stripping away topsoil by overgrazing, deforesting areas faster than we choose to reforest them, mining activities without cleanup processes, inefficient irrigation practices that pump out more water than we need, the buildup of drying salts from over-irrigation, and soil compaction from unsustainable farming techniques. Another major concern is salinization, or the buildup of salts in soils. Irrigated land sees a drastic rise in salt buildup because there is more water being sprayed in these areas than they would naturally see. Remember, fresh water still contains salts. The salts are not evaporated away magically with the water, so they are left behind. Improper irrigation techniques can stunt plant growth, lower crop yields, and kill plants or permanently ruin the land, because you have exceeded the range of tolerance for salt of the organisms grown here, aka the complete opposite of what you were trying to do with the land. The common pattern we see with soil erosion is that it is caused by poor agricultural practices. The best way to increase soil conservation is to change the way we farm. A major farming technique change we have seen in the last few decades is called terracing. This is where a farmer takes an elevated slope cuts out tiers, and farms on each tier. This flattens the land being used, which reduces soil erosion by water runoff. We also need to look at tillage, or the overturning of soil to mix in nutrients. Conventional tillage farming follows this technique and eventually helped loosen up soil and led to an increase in soil loss to erosion. Conservation tillage farming doesn't loosen up the soil as much, just the soil and the direct contact with the future plants. Because there is no major overturn here, it has led to a reduction in soil erosion in areas that use this technique. We saw terracing with larger slopes, but on smaller slopes we can practice contour farming. Here the rows follow the contours of the land to help flatten it out and reduce soil erosion. Another practice is to steer clear of monocultures or farmland with only one type of crop and switch to polycultures in strip cropping. With the use of polycultures or land with more than one type of crop, Farmers can alternate the crops they have by row and allow for more ground covering organisms to hold in soil between rows of organisms that are taller than they are wide. This helps naturally hold on to the soil to reduce runoff and also allows for a means of integrated pest management as well. An idea close to this but not used in rows is called agroforestry. It has the same benefits as strip cropping but actually sees them dramatically increased. This is much closer to how the organisms would grow naturally. These have all been ways to drastically decrease water erosion, but you have to remember that we also need to consider wind. We can create wind breaks or rows of taller organisms to prevent the wind from blowing away any exposed soil. With the degraded soil we have now, we have to start considering fertilizers as a must-have. Soils depleted of essential nutrients simply won't produce high quality or quantity crops. The two major categories are organic and inorganic. Inorganic fertilizers are much like the inorganic pesticides we discussed in past units. They are formulated in a lab and produce the expected product you want. They contain the exact nutrients you want. You can buy different inorganic fertilizers with different concentrations of each nutrient depending upon, or dependent upon the crop you're trying to grow. Organic fertilizers come from organic sources. That's why they're called that. This can be an animal waste, decaying or decomposing plants, compost, we're just implementing more fungal growth to increase the rate of soil production in a field. What are the pros and cons of each? Organic fertilizers improve the soil's ability to retain water, the soil structure, the range of nutrients found, as well as future soil growth by promoting the biological agents in soil formation. But it is more expensive and requires more land and work to produce. Inorganic fertilizers are cheap, easily transported, and can treat specific problems but they do not add organic material to the soil, reduce the soil's ability to hold water, which is important for plant growth, 
lowers dissolved oxygen levels, supplies only limited plant nutrients, releases nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas, and can lead to eutrophication when erosion occurs. So there are two major laws to remember for this unit, and they are extremely straightforward. The Soil Erosion Act of 1935 was enacted to create the Soil Conservation Service after the Dust Bowl to, well, conserve soil. The Soil and Water Conservation Act of 1977 was put in place to increase the study of and protection of, you guessed it, soil and water. My best AP tip here is to remind you that conservation is key. Any FRQ about pollution should include some response for you about preservation or conservation.